I think the year that I keep talking about is 26, but uh, a lot of the data is pointing to like, you know, if everyone thinks 25, well, that's out. Hmm. So it's for sure going to be shorter or longer by a year in either direction. And then that could have implications for the beginning of that following year. Cause remember hmm. this stuff completes in a December, January, February, like sort of time frame. So the CPI data comes out today, slightly hotter than expected. So not really that big of a deal either way. Um, but it does kind of lead us to the question. And we don't even know what those numbers really are. You know, I don't know that anybody right. really believes some of the CPI data. But it does lead to the question of what do you think Jerome Powell and the Fed may do at these next couple of meetings? I think we have three left here in 2023 that next of which is just a week from today on 920. Um, but what do you think the Fed may be looking to do with still a 90% expectation that they still will pause rate hikes here for this next meeting? But through the end of the year and then into 2024, what do you kind of think the expectation might be from the Fed? So I so like what I'm looking right now and I'm seeing that we're basically at uh, 2000, like summer of 2006 levels. Um, and it stayed that way for an entire 12, 12 month period. So a full year, uh, rates stayed around 5.28%. And uh, that's interesting in and of itself. The other thing, other historical data about just this relative level that we're at is like going back to like 1994, all the way until the year 2000, rates oscillated like just slightly north and south of that same 5.28 level for what is that, like uh, six or seven years. And so, you know, this is, seems to be based on uh, going on now 20 years plus of data, a, gen a region where the Fed historically likes to keep rates stable. And so I could definitely see uh, 2024, end of this year, 2023, where rates will stay relatively stable. That means like marginal rate height um, or marginal decrease or just a pause. Um, but I think generally we're going to oscillate around this 5.25 to 5.3 region. And what does that mean for crypto? And what does that mean for the for like the dollar index and things? Um, well, usually if the rates are high, then the cost of money is high. And if people are getting really good payouts in the bond yields, um, they want those payouts to be something in, that's valuable or going up in value, which would explain why the dollar has seen such a surge here in the past. How many months has it been? Just uh, since you know May, basically since it bottomed. So. Or was right. something like let's say it was bottoming in uh, July. So yeah, so it's been a crazy rally on the dollar, and that's that's taken risk off the table for cryptocurrency, and it's caused problems for the stock market as well, and even even gold. So the gold's been in a retracement, but it also performed tremendously well since last October. So another one that's been interesting is is uh, oil, right? Oil is uh, on a huge tear as well. And the, you know how oil and the dollar are kind of tied together in a lot of ways. And it is like the main source of energy in the world. And so uh, it makes sense that the most prolific um, fiat currency and the most used energy source are kind of somewhat tied hand in hand in their rallies and their sell offs. So uh, maybe one will lead the other. I, we could, you know, you could always go into a deeper analysis on that. Um, but in terms of like risk being on or off right now, it seems like risk is off or neutral. And, you know, this is like an inflection point for the markets where the inflation, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the Fed funds rate is kind of the, the leading indicator, I think, for, for what, what's to come. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I want to get... Um... You know, with with assuming that rates will be like relatively static, you know, whether there is any more slight increases, I don't think we're going to see anything in an increment other than like a quarter of a, a point is what we've been seeing for a while anyway now. Um, but I want to ask, like, as far as this upcoming cycle in crypto, you know, there's been a lot of talk. I think I've heard you address this. Um, obviously, your friend Sami has been talked to, talking about this idea a lot. Bob Lucas, actually, uh, creator of the 60 Day Cycles or he talks about a lot for Bitcoin anyway, talking about the possibility of this left translated cycle possibility where we may get a quicker top sometime after the halving early, not early next year, but earlier than we would think next year, um, that maybe the top of the market for a while and possibly catch people off guard. When I saw Bob Lucas's most recent video, he actually, I think before he was kind of split on what scenarios he thought uh, would transpire, whether it was the left translated cycle or kind of our more normal 
traditional cycle where we see a top deep into 2025. Do you have any thoughts on this just kind of based on the macro environment? Does the macro environment like heavily weigh into what you're seeing there or you know, all these different things kind of coming together right now with what we're seeing with BlackRock and these ETFs and these new ETF applications. What do you kind of see as the chances for these different outcomes in the overall crypto cycle coming up? Yeah. So like with in terms of just to address the ETFs and like a lot of the interesting like news pieces around that and uh, a lot of the wins coming out for the crypto space against regulators, it's really kind of uncanny how the crypto is now all of a sudden being accepted and they're winning cases left and right. And uh, all at the same time, it's like your biggest funds in the world are, are submitting applications for ETFs. So that's already an interesting setup. Now, in terms of left translated cycle and what I see for specifically the crypto market going into the next uh, couple of years, two to three years, it really hinges on something that Ben Cohen talks about, which is like the liquidity that's out there. And if you look at like the Fed's balance sheet, that's like one of the charts I like to look at to measure, you know, are there more or less dollars available? So it's kind of an ultimate squeeze. So like you can't live in your crypto, you can't eat your crypto. So the really, it's really the most liquid thing and the first thing you go to sell when uh, you need cash to survive, right? And so... Until there's an excess of liquidity, I, I think it's going to be a hard, it's going to be hard to get everybody globally on board to start aping into risk assets. And so what does that mean for crypto? That probably means that until one of a few things happens, either rates get lowered or QE, quantitative easing, comes back online, or you see some form of more um, easy access to money and, and cheaper money to borrow you won't see the same cycle that we've seen in the past. That doesn't mean that we couldn't see an early market cycle top for Bitcoin in the next 12 to 18 months that would then eventually potentially lead into like a longer, more extended bull market that does not look like a traditional bull market that would last and it would have a, tr would have a significant pullback somewhere in the middle end of next year into the following year. And then you wouldn't have your actual, you know, liquidity that you need to make this thing happen until after the presidential election cycles closed out and you have a new sitting president here in the U.S. and um, financial policies have shifted and uh, perhaps that means lowered rates or money printing is back. Um, and so I think, um, you know, in terms of like social sentiment, like people are sick of the way that the last few years have gone here in the States. And uh, there's a good yeah. chance that we'll see a complete change going into 25 and 26, which typically I would say 25 is the setup year and 26 and maybe even into 27 is our, uh, our traditional magical crypto bull market that we all know and love. And I heard you're, you say that. I forget where. Well, I'll well, let you go, Ewok. I just yeah, I was just going to say. So you're thinking 2027 to be the the big year. I think the year that I keep talking about is 26. But uh, a lot of the data is pointing to like, you know, if everyone thinks 25, well, that's out. Right. Hmm. So it's for sure going to be shorter or longer by a year in either direction. And then that could have implications for the beginning of that following year. Because remember, okay. a lot of times this stuff completes in a december january february like right sort of time frame yep because it's all hinging on that tax season stuff right because that's what usually happens is mm -hmm. people profit take and they try to plan for tax reasons in either way and that means either they're going to tax harvest on a loss the in that december before which could be your 26 and then then the following year you get that final blow off into may sell in may go away in 27 yeah. i don't know but uh this will probably be the first time you've heard of something like that but it's definitely you know this is a ever-changing and dynamic market and a dynamic theory so what i say today might might be adjusted or changed based on what happens with uh, some some major macro play that you know i have no control over in the next 12 months sure fair enough yeah. Yeah, um, people like to not let you forget that, though, if you uh, change <laughs> yeah. market views, though, as we know. Um, but yeah, you're right. I have heard you mention that 2026 thing before. And, you know, that that's kind of tied to what we are seeing as far as the conditions in the market right now. 
macro wise. But I mean, do you think like the further that we do go on, we know obviously the BTC's gains are going to diminish over time and they have been. Um, do you think even the cycles may just start to look, I'm not talking anything about necessarily a super cycle concept, but may not just be so cut and dried like we've been used to, you know, like I was referencing the traditional four year cycles as we go on and all this asset class matures. I mean, do you think that kind of gets a little bit more gray um, as far as the timing and stuff like that? Yep, it does. And the reason is because of the underlying Bitcoin mining economy. So like everything in crypto relies on the layer one, layer zero Bitcoin mining economy that 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 is like the foundation or the roots of the whole system. Like all liquidity flows through Bitcoin first, essentially. And this would be the this would be a first for for in terms of a crypto cycle where potentially another chain like Ethereum and all of its alternate layer one EVM chains that are kind of like parallel to it would have its own cycle built in there as well potentially, but I'm not hinging on that. I'm just going with what I know, which is that Bitcoin mining hash rate globally is at all time highs and Bitcoin price is not at all time highs. And typically what one of the biggest catalysts for what drives price appreciation for Bitcoin and thus crypto is the amount of that the having has an effect on incoming supply. So there is a potential here because of the amount of Bitcoin supply on exchanges being on a downtrend now for three years. And it's like historic, like we've never seen this low amount of a liquidity for Bitcoin on exchanges ever um, yeah. since I think 2020, since the COVID crash, I think is when we've just started to see a de an accelerated descent away from exchanges, which means that large funds are custodying it and housing it away and believing in it more long term. And it's, you know, Bitcoin made it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And <laughs> So, so no longer does the having have much of an as much of an effect on, in terms of new supply coming on that could be a threat to price appreciation as much as the lack of Bitcoin on exchanges met multiplied by the amount of Metcalf's law taking hold and user adoption by 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 big billionaire types players could have an effect on price. So this will be like that first cycle where we'll see mining isn't in addition to this you know, mining isn't the only thing that's going to drive price appreciation this cycle. It's going to be real demand followed up by a real shortage of supply. Now, in addition to that, you're, the, the amount of like Bitcoin that's coming off this cycle is like it's going from, I think, 3.25 to like one point something. I'm going to check it right now. But you're, you're, you're not really, you're not, the amount of new Bitcoin being issued is going from like, well, I got to find out what it is. Hold on. Yeah, oh, it's not much. Adding. It's not much of a decrease, actually, is what you're saying. Correct. And so then, so then where do you get opportunity for gains in that dynamic is from the cost to produce Bitcoins on an energy level mm -hmm. and the amount of initial investment that goes in. So this might be a unique situation where we have record low cost to produce Bitcoin because mining equipment is super efficient and we have billions of dollars of um, um, investment funds that don't need to be paid back tomorrow. And that was probably borrowed at a much lower interest rate uh, be previous to the hikes in interest rates because these yeah. Bitcoin mines were getting set up two and three years ago sure. when Bitcoin was blowing up. And so I just think there's going to be so much less negative externalities. And But I don't think it's the supply getting cut in half this time that's going to be a driving factor as much as it is shortage of supply out there in the market and just... Um, cost to produce new bitcoins is down low so less needs to be sold and i think it's really going to be quite the squeeze to see now what that looks like to me is it's like a longer term thing so we might not we might get like 80k bitcoin next year and then we might sell off to 30k and then you might get the the actual real supply squeeze after the etf's been launched and everything in a year perhaps and going into 26 and 27 whereas like the real pinch happens because there just is not enough bitcoin to go around um, but again, there's two theories here. One is like an organic buildup going into 25 and 26. And the other is a double bubble cycle where you get next year is good then a down year or half a year down. And then the following year is good. Kind of like what we saw with 2019, but on a bigger scale.